Uh, now for a second dose of thinking about progressive enhancement. Uh, Jeremy Keith, who we are extremely honored to have at Responsive Field Day, in especially because his and his company Clear Left's Responsive Day Out is the source of inspiration for this event. So we are very happy that Jeremy was able to make the trip all the way from Brighton to here. And are you ready there, Jeremy? He's so ready. All right, ready. Jeremy's gonna talk about Be Progressive. All right, thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Am I on? Yes? Okay, cool. Um, all right, thank you very much, Liza. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of awesome to be here and seeing, it's like Responsive Day Out, but it's in Portland and you guys are doing it and it's, it's, I'm genuinely touched. It's, it's really, really cool. Um, yes, yeah, lovely to be here, but I am well aware, of course, I am the only thing standing between you and, and food trucks, food carts. Um, more importantly, you are the only thing standing between me and food trucks. So. Let's get on with this. Um, so, so Tom kicked off by, by having a, a kind of a definition of progressive enhancement, and I should probably do the same, right? I should define what I'm talking about when I say progressive enhancement. Um, but I, I don't have a definition of progressive enhancement. Sorry. Uh, what I do have, because I don't think of progressive enhancement as being a particular uh, technique or, or set of technologies. I don't actually think it's anything to do with JavaScript or HTML. It's kind of a process to me. Um, and it's just the way I tend to work when I'm building on the web. So I thought, why don't I outline that process to you and show you some examples of that process in action. So it's a, it's a three-step process, uh, and it goes like this. Step one, when I'm building a service, I'm building something on the web, I identify the core functionality. Core functionality, this is crucial. Not all the possible things, the core functionality. And then I try and make that functionality available using the simplest possible technology. Right? And I know it sounds pretty washy, I'm not wishy-washy, I'm not saying like it must be HTML or it must be a particular uh, framework or it must be a particular technology. No, no, whatever for that particular functionality happens to be the, the simplest technology. And then I enhance. And this is where all the, the fun lies, right, in that third step. That's where you really get to shine. Um, so let's go, let's go through this. Uh, step one, identifying the core functionality. Let's take a look at, at some examples. So let's say I'm, uh, I'm providing a news service. I'm a news provider. Well, I would say, well, the core functionality is for people to be able to access the news. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, let's say I've got some kind of messaging service where people can, can send and receive messages. Well, there's the core functionality right there, the ability to send and receive messages. Uh, if I'm building a photo sharing app, well, the clue's in the title, photo sharing, right? I need to be able to see photographs from other people and I need to be able to provide photographs from myself. Uh, if I'm building uh, an online collaboration tool to do with writing, editing, then there's the core functionality right there, right? The, the ability to write something, the ability to edit, uh, the ability to share. Okay, so step one usually doesn't take very long at all, right? Identifying the core functionality. Then it's about making that functionality available using the simplest technology. So again, we're only thinking about the core functionality here. We're not making a list of all the possible things that this service could do, or all the possible uh, things that could be in there, just the core functionality. So in the case of providing the news, uh, I'm thinking, okay, well, how can I provide the news on the web using the simplest possible technology? Well, that would be, that would be HTML, right? It would take my content, which is probably text, maybe some images, maybe video, and I would mark it up using the right elements for the right job. Pretty straightforward. Um, likewise, if I was providing this messaging service, right, I want to mark up the content, but okay, now I need to be able to read messages that are coming from other people, uh, probably in reverse chronological order. Okay, we've got HTML for that. Uh, and I need to be able to pro provide a message, right, going out there. Well, this is where forms would come in, probably a very simple form, like an input with a, with a button. Done. In the case of a photo sharing app, pretty similar. I need to be able to view uh, images in this case that other people have provided, so that's what we got the image element for. And I need to be able to provide an image. And again, forms to the rescue, right? It's a different type of input this time. Input type equals file, but I can now provide uh, uh, an image. Now, of course, the experience here is gonna be pretty pretty crap, right? But that's okay. It's, it's, it's still available to everyone, right? This is the core functionality being made available using the simplest possible technology. And in the case of this uh, writing app, right? I want to be able to write something. Well, yeah, right into a text area. And let's, let's call it a day, right? Except we don't call it a day because it's the third step that really counts. It's the third step where you get to have fun and it's the third step where you spend your time and that's where you enhance. 
So in the case of providing nudes, I've got it structured into HTML. Uh, the next step is making it look good, right? So uh, providing layout as an enhancement. Now thinking of layout as an enhancement might seem weird, but then if you think about what responsive design does, it kind of treats layout as an enhancement, right? If you're doing it the right way, you begin with your core styles, and then you've got your layout grids inside your media queries. Well, your, your layout is an enhancement. Um, I mean, technically, all the CSS you write is an enhancement, right? Every line of CSS is a suggestion to the browser how to render something. Uh, like providing really nice fonts, right? We have the ability now on the web to provide custom fonts and provide a really nice reading experience. So this is stuff we're layering on top of the core functionality of simply being able to access the news is now well, I want to be able to read the news in a beautiful, uh, beautifully uh, rendered way. So likewise with the, uh, with this messaging app, right, we'll so be able to send and receive messages using you know, pretty clunky HTML and full page refreshes, not a great experience, but available to everyone. Uh, but we don't have to stop here, right, because you know, providing some Ajax would be the obvious enhancement here so that we don't get the full page refreshes uh, every time I, I send a message uh, out to my friends on the service. And we can make it work both ways, right? Some kind of uh, web socket technology so that when there's a new message sent by a friend, I get to see it right there in my browser without the full page refresh. Uh, and we could apply Ajax and WebSockets to the photo sharing app as well, right, to get the same, uh, same sort of results, but we can go even further. We can start playing around with things like uh, the file API, right, at the moment that that photograph is in the browser, we can start to do some fun stuff with it, like applying CSS filters, okay, so let's add a sepia tone onto that photograph, right? Um, and this, you know, maybe this won't be supported in every possible browser, but you know, that's okay, because the core functionality, which we identified as being able to view and share photographs, that's available to everyone, everything after that is basically an enhancement. And then when we get into the you know, interactive writing application, well, okay, we've got a clunky text area, again, full page refreshes, not a great experience, but available to everyone. But now we can really start to enhance this. You know, some kind of local storage, and I don't mean the specific technology, because there's a whole range of ways of storing things locally. Um, you, you, you know, let, let's try and bypass the server completely if that's a, possible, that's a possibility, right? Let's store everything in the browser. And offline. I, I share Tom's excitement about offline. And there's one particular technology I'm most excited about right now. It's Service Worker. Service Worker is this amazing technology for being able to make things work offline. And it's been designed in such a way that you use it as an enhancement, right? In order to use Service Worker, you have to have an initial payload first, and then you say, okay, here's what we're going to do. Uh, you know, if the connectivity fails, we're going to make it work offline. Here's what we're going to have notifications. Uh, really exciting technology and very much an enhancement on top of that basic functionality of, hey, I'm typing something into a, into a text area. So if you haven't you know, checked out Service Worker, I highly recommend doing it. So that's sort of my three-step process, right? Identify the core functionality, make that core functionality available using the simplest possible technology, and then enhance. Now, what I like about this, um, this three-step process is it's scale-free. And by that I mean, it works on the level of the site or the service itself, right? What's the core functionality of the, the whole service? But you could also make it work at the level of a URL, right? What is the core functionality of this particular URL? Uh, how can I make that core functionality available and then how can I enhance? You can go even deeper. You could, you could apply this three-step process at the level of a pattern. Right, what's the basic thing this pattern needs to do? How can I do that in the most simplest way? And then how can I enhance? Uh, Scott Jail over at Filament Group, he showed some great examples of this. Like, uh, let's say you're providing directions. Well, that the core functionality is to provide directions. The simplest way of doing that would be you know, text. Here's an address. And then you could enhance, like swap out the text with an image of a map. And you could enhance that map and make it a slippy map. You could enhance that and have animations, all sort of good stuff, right? But still following this three-step process. So for me, this is progressive enhancement. It's a process, a fairly simple process at that. And yet, I come across a lot of uh, pushback, and I think a lot of misconceptions uh, around this idea. Uh, I think the first one is that this idea that this means you're designing for the lowest common denominator. Uh, and that's not true. It does mean that you are starting with the lowest common denominator because you are thinking, well, what's the core functionality? And what's the simplest possible technology? You are beginning you know, with, with the baseline functionality. But you don't stop there, right? Step three is really, really important, where you, you make it work uh, beautifully for as many people as possible. So fundamentally, I think this 
this sort of myth comes down to a misconception that progressive enhancement, that, that there are these two sides between like, oh, it's either JavaScript frameworks or it's providing basic functionality. It's not a question of either basic functionality or an immersive, rich experience. It's both, right? And it's also, it's not the case that you begin with the immersive, rich experience and then try and make it into the basic functionality. I wouldn't recommend it. No, begin with the basic functionality and enhance up to the immersive, rich experience. But there's no dichotomy here. There's no problem. It's perfectly possible to provide both. Begin with the basic functionality, then layer on all that, all that wonderful experience on top of that. And it kind of related to that, I think there's this, this idea that this means you're going to spend all your time dealing with older browsers, right? Saying, oh, we've got to make it available to everyone. Great, well, now I have to test on all these old browsers. Uh, I found the opposite. Right? Because I've, I've made you know, a little time at the start to decide what's the core functionality, and I've provided that with the most simplest technolo technology possible, that then I basically don't spend any time worrying about older browsers, because I know it's going to work. I know that the, you know, the text area or the simple input is going to work in, in any kind of device. And I spend all of my time at step three, playing around with the coolest, newest APIs in the latest browsers, you know, regardless of what the support is like. Uh, so again, this, I think this is a misconception. Uh, Time-wise, of that three-step process, you're going to spend a lot more time on step number three than you do on steps one and two, right? That most of the work you do is going to be in the enhancing, which means most of the time you're going to spend is actually with the fun stuff in the modern browsers, playing with the newest toys. In a way, this, this three-step process is kind of the only responsible way to approach you know, new APIs, new browser features, because it means you can, you can have your cake and eat it too. You get to play around with this stuff, you get to, you get to implement stuff that's only uh, supported in one browser, secure in the knowledge that the core functionality is still available for everyone, even if the experience isn't as good. That's okay. And then, you know, this is a big one. People thinking, oh, well, this is about, you know, you progressive enhancement means you have to make everything work without JavaScript. Now, this is why I wanted to emphasize core functionality. Not all possible functionality, core functionality. It's about the figuring out, well, what, what is the one thing that this service provides? How to provide that to everyone without any technological restrictions? But then I can layer on all sorts of stuff that does require JavaScript. Um, Matt Marquis, when he was talking about the, resp uh, the responsive design of, uh, of Boston Globe, he said, you know, there's, uh, there's plenty of features on the Boston Globe site that require JavaScript, but reading the news isn't one of them, right? So there's a big distinction between making your core functionality available without, say, JavaScript or some other technology, and, oh, we've got to make everything available without JavaScript. No. And I guess related to that is this, this is the biggest myth of all, right? All right, this is about people switching off JavaScript. Now, it's no more about people switching off JavaScript than responsive design is about people grabbing the corners of their browsers and making it go squishy, right? <laughs> That's a good rough test, right? Is this site responsive? Yeah, grab the corners. Oh, yeah, it's responsive. That's not actually how people use websites, right? Similarly, if you switch off JavaScript, you can test, say, oh, right, okay, they've made JavaScript a requirement for rendering text on a screen, eh. but it's not how people are actually going to use the web. In fact, browsers make it harder and harder for you to switch off JavaScript. So it's absolutely not about people switching off JavaScript, but that doesn't mean that JavaScript is ubiquitous, right? My former colleague Andy Hume said that progressive enhancement is more about dealing with technology failing than technology not being supported. There's a lot of things that could possibly go wrong. Stuart Language has kind of outlined some of the things that could go wrong. And some of this is going to be, you know, in the user's browser. Some of it might be on your server. Some of it might be on the network in the between. But these are all the possible things that could go wrong with sending JavaScript down the wire. And sure, this, these things could go wrong with HTML and CSS as well. But generally, you know, it's not going to matter as much because HTML and CSS have this lax error handling where, you know, if there's a mistake, it just skips over it and carries on. Whereas if there's a mistake in the JavaScript, you get an error and you don't get to parse the rest of the JavaScript file. Um, so just because this isn't about people switching off JavaScript doesn't mean that JavaScript is always 100% available. Uh, and even if the, any of this stuff happens and it's only on a small percentage, right, you know, 2 3% of, of, of users, it's not actually about 2 3% of your visitors. It's about 2 3% of your visits, right? We've all been in this situation even though we've had super fast phones or super fast laptops, because we've been on hotel Wi-Fi or we've been on that train going through the tunnel, right? But I think the biggest pushback that I get about this, this three-step approach 
falls into two categories. And the first category is, it's too easy, as in, it's too simplistic. Now, what you're suggesting here, this simple three-step approach, does not scale, uh, does not work for the, for the very complicated thing that I'm building, right? Uh, and that argument sounds familiar to me, because I remember hearing it. I remember hearing it, uh, you know, late 90s, start to the 21st century, when uh, we had the Web Standards Project, when trying to convince people to stop using tables for layout and font tags and, you know, switch over to using CSS for layout, switch over to using Web Standards, allow HTML to be structural and semantic. And people will say, well, that's all well and good for your little blog. <laughs> that's all well and good for your little portfolio site. But I'm running you know, an important corporate site, right? business. And it just won't scale. But then you know, Doug Bowman comes along and does the Wired.com redesign. Or Mike Davidson come along, comes along and does the ESPN.com redesign. And it's, it's clear that, oh yeah, no, this, this can work, even for a large site. And I heard it again when Ethan came out with responsive web design and you know, there was a lot of pushback because people, well, that's fine for your little example there. That's fine for your little blog, your little portfolio site, but it's never going to scale for my large corporate site or my big web app. And then you know, the Boston Globe redesigns or Microsoft.com does a responsive homepage. And it's like, oh yeah, this can be done. It does scale. And right now I feel like there's, there's space to show that this can be done for big, complex you know, web apps, to show that you can have your cake and eat it too by employing this three-step approach. And there's room for somebody to be the, the Boston Globe of, of uh, progressive enhancement and you know, immersive and yet ubiquitous apps. But like I said, this is just, say, 50% of pushback. So people say, ah, this is too easy. This is, this is too simplistic. It won't scale. The other pushback I get is, this is too hard. <laughs> All right? And actually, you know, to be fair, I think there's something in this. Because people will look at this at the three-step approach and go, wait, 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 wait a minute. You're saying I go through the trouble of figuring out what's the core functionality, and I make that available using the simplest possible, te possible technology, which probably involves, like I said, some HTML. And certainly, there's going to be a server-side component right, to handle the input that gets sent and do something with it and send back full pages. And then when I get to step three, what? I just replace all of that? I write, write, do I write everything twice? Right? Once on the server and then once again in JavaScript? Um, no, you don't write everything twice. Maybe you do end up duplicating some functionality, though. I'm not going to shy away from that. Um, I think it's worth it. I think it's like you're building in a, a baseline, and it's worth the extra time to do that. But again, it's not about providing all possible functionality you know, on the server and then, and then replacing all of it with JavaScript. It's just making sure that the core functionality is there. But when people say, well, surely this takes more time than if I simply jump to step three. Like, what if I just assume that JavaScript's available, I jump to step three and build it all in JavaScript on the client? It's like, yes, that's true. It, it will be faster to do that. But I think it's worth spending that little time to sort of to, to have that, that safety net to know that should something go wrong on the client, you've kind of got this fallback on the server. But it is true that this is not the easy way. It's not the it's not the simplest way, as in there aren't tools really to help you. If you decide you're going to build it entirely in the client using JavaScript, there's plenty of great tools out there, plenty of fantastic frameworks that will help you do that. Whereas here, I'm suggesting a wishy-washy process, and there's no avoiding that work, right? You have to figure out what's the core functionality. You have to decide what's the simplest technology to make that core functionality available. There aren't tools to help you that there, right? I don't, I don't know your service. I don't know your, what you're providing. I can't answer that for you. You have to answer that for yourself. But then I think, well, yeah, okay, maybe it's, it's, it's more work. But, you know, that's why it's called work. <laughs> Sometimes... Sometimes you've got to put in the work. It's not as hard as it sounds, though. And here's the thing. Again, this, this is also familiar, because I remember this when we were trying to switch over from you know, tables for layout to using CSS. Uh, people said, ah, this is going to be so hard. And you know what? The first time you switched over from using tables for layout to using CS, CSS for layout, it was harder. It definitely was harder. It definitely did take longer. But then the second time, it didn't take quite as long. And the third time, it was shorter still. And then eventually, it just becomes normal. Likewise, if you'd been building fixed width websites for years, and then you switch over to responsive design, that first responsive design project, right? Pretty painful. It's harder. It's, it's, it takes more time. But the second one, I bet that went a bit easier. And the third one, easier again, right? And then it becomes normal. 
It becomes the way you do it. So I think that's kind of what you need to do, is like internalize this. This should be the normal way of building on the web. And I think it's worth it, like I said, because you build up this, you know, the safety net. We often talk about when we use a particular technology, a particular tool, there's a danger that you'll, you'll have this technical debt Right, the further down the line, you're going to have to deal with problems. That you save time in the short term, but it's going to cost you further on. And I feel like using this approach is almost like you're creating technical credit. Right? It's like you've given yourself, you've given yourself some leeway for, for the unpredictable stuff that's coming, coming in the future that, you know, that Brad was talking about, that Sophie was talking about. And there's a certain irony here, you know. Um, you know, Brad's talking about being future friendly, and it turns out that the best way to be future friendly is to be backwards compatible. Right, by having that baseline. So fundamentally, what this approach does, and I guess what progressive enhancement for me is, it's about replacing assumptions. Replacing assumptions like, well, let's assume everyone has JavaScript, or let's assume everyone has a super fast phone, let's assume everyone has connectivity, let's assume uh, you know, a perfectly spherical browser. And it replaces those assumptions with an acceptance of the fact that shit happens, right? An acceptance of the fact that, you know, packets will get lost, and acceptance of the fact that you, your audience is incredibly diverse, acceptance of the fact that people have all kinds of different devices, uh, all kinds of different contexts, and that's fine, that's okay, that's not something to be scared of, as long as you're you know, thinking in this way, uh, it's all going to work out fine. And I would say that if you're not keen on the term progressive enhancement, that's absolutely fine as well. This isn't about you know, defining something or, you know, like, it's, like Tom said, it's not a dichotomy between particular frameworks and particular technologies and this idea of progressive enhancement. It's not really about JavaScript or any particular technology. It's just about a way of approaching building for the web. And try it. Be progressive. Thank you.